It says, You have sought the Lord, the Lord concerning the works of my hand, and even commanded ye me. And I tell you today, there's coming a turn, a left turn. And when you take this turn, a place which has been there all along will open up for you. For things have been annoying, and there's been detours, and you will and you have said in your heart, where is this place and how shall I know? And the Lord says, by the spirit of truth. For you have said in your heart, it's not always a yes or a no that I hear, or even a voice behind me saying, this is the way, walk in it. But you will know and understand and even teach, I heard teach, in a greater level from this hard left that you will make in the coming new year. Be at peace and know that I'm on the throne. And when you say in your heart, what if I get lost? What if this pass not the way it seems clear? For pioneering is an unknown territory, but I say to you today that every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. So rejoice and be glad, and I'll bring secrets to you today to bring you rest. I don't know who this is for. If you want that, I'll give it to you. Amen. Pastors are on a Caribbean cruise. They were in Cayman yesterday. I was woke up to an alarming text. Um, the motor broke on the boat. <laughs> pray, Karen. I said, oh boy. Beth, we got to pray. She said, I don't want to go out to sea. And the motor be malfunctioned again. So she, we went to prayer, didn't we? And we prayed. And they couldn't get off the boat, and they were, they were close to Cayman, though, so they weren't at sea. And that was God right there, you know, that kept them from breaking out at sea and not close to Cayman. So I'm texting her. She's not answering. I don't know what's going on. And finally she sends me a text and says, we're on land. And I'm like, okay. She didn't say anything else about the mo motor. I didn't see anything else. And then this morning I get a text. Apparently the motor got fixed. She says, we're in Cayman. Tell the church I said hi from Cayman. Uh, excuse me, they were in Cayman. They were in Jamaica this morning. So we bless them, Lord. We don't want to not give thanks and pray for them. And we thank you, Father, for the time that they have away. Lord, let it, let it be for themselves and let them know that everything home at home is well taken care of in Jesus' name. Do you have your Bibles this morning? Turn to Genesis 25. I hope I can do this right. Anybody hear this tune before? Na 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 na. Na na na. come in and download stuff and I didn't want to bother somebody to do it. I didn't my phone doesn't work in here. I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everybody likes a little Clint Eastwood, don't they? That's the title of my sermon this morning. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Everybody there at Genesis 25? This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became, oh, we're starting at verse 19, I'm sorry. I'll let you get there. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. She's the daughter of Bethel and Armion from, and sister Laban and Armion. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled in each other babies. Two jostled in each other within her, and she said, why is this happening? So she went to the Lord to inquire. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time had come for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first one came out red, his whole body was hairy like a garment, and they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's foot, and so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to the 60. Wow. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, 
a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came from the open country, vanished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that stew. I'm hungry. Jacob replied, first tell me your birthright. That's pretty ugly, isn't it? He's hungry. He said, look, I'm about to die. Esau said, well, what good is this birthright going to do me? If I don't get some me, I'm going to die. But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling him his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and some lentil soup, and he did eat and drink, and then he got up and left. So as we see in the chapter, Esau means hairy and rough. But Jacob, Jacob's name, name means to follow or to be behind. To give your birthright for some food, he must have been pretty hungry. I'm thinking. It doesn't say how long he was out there. Esau was a herdsman and the owner of animals, a hunter. So he probably had a smell to him. What do you think? Yeah. Later in Genesis, it called him a wandering hunter. But Jacob was a shepherd. What was the birthright back in those days? The, the birthright was the firstborn son. He would inherit both the position or the inheritance, and gain the leadership of the family, the father's authority. So Jacob wanted what was rightfully Esau's. Takes me back to a time when my husband told me about um, his entitlement. He, he, said, he said his dad had a gun. He remembers, we've been together for 40, good night, 40, ooh, We'll be married 45 years this year, probably about 48. We've been together a long time. Tells my young age, doesn't it? Um, he told me about this gun that his aunt had. And he also told me about a little box that she had, and it had his name on it. And she lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I had the pleasure of meeting her. And I saw the box. And I guess because we were so young and frivolous and not settled down, so to speak, um, we couldn't take the box at that time because we were still like a wanderers trying to find out, I guess, where the Lord wanted us. But um, I saw the box and it had his name on it. Well, she had passed away and we inquired about the box. We made phone calls about the box. We wrote letters to family members up there about this box. That box was his. It had his name on it. It wasn't so much about what was in the box, the money aspect, as it was the memory aspect for him. He wanted what his father wanted him to have. Well, we found out what happened to the box and what happened to the gun. And that was hard for us um, because I knew it meant something to him, and I don't want to skip ahead in my sermon, but um, we had inquired, we never got that box. We had never gotten that box. In, in Ephesians 6.12, it says, you don't need to go there, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's right. We wrestle against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness and against spiritual wickedness. You know, greed is a wickedness. Yes. That's a wickedness in high places. John 10.10 10 says, Only the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they would have life and that more abundantly. In Proverbs, it talks about people don't despise him a thief because if you find him, he's got to repay sevenfold. I can't tell you the petitions. Has anybody here had something stolen from them in their life? Yeah. We put petitions up before the enemy because the Bible says if you find him, he's got to he's got to pay you back sevenfold. It's not the people. In John ten ten, it says who the thief is. The devil is the thief. 
He's the one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I went so many different places with this. Back to the story. Um, before Isaac's death, he blessed Jacob, both in Genesis 27 and 28. They did it with their hands back then. See, his eyes dimmed. He became blind. So what he did was he put on a coat, and he, meaning J uh, Jacob, put on a, a furry coat, and he bathed his mouth and his self in some smelly animal stuff. And he, apparently, uh, Isaac had called for some food. I'm off my notes here. He had called for some food. He knew he was dying, and he wanted to bless his son. So he called for Esau, which is his firstborn, and he asked Esau to make him some food and come. He wanted to lay his hands on him. He wanted to bless him. He wanted to do that impartation. So he makes him some food, he meaning Jacob, and he makes the food, and he takes it into his father. Isaac can't see him. He lays his hand on him, and he blesses him. He blesses the wrong boy. Well, once that blessing is pronounced, it can't be taken back. It's almost like a natural will, last will and testament that we have here. Beth and I talked about this over and over. Um, powers of attorney, medical directives, and last will and testaments are all documents that we need to have while we're living because they tell where we want our last, you know, what our wishes are. Well, that's what this blessing was that Isaac's imparting to who he thought was Esau. I thought that was kind of ugly. He, be, he betrayed his father in that aspect, I think. Um, and it made me ask in my heart, why in the world didn't he take back once he found out who the blessing was imparted to, why couldn't he take it back? And as I don't want to repeat myself, but this is important. When you pronounce something, the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. There's power in your words. Even back in the very Old Testament, when they pronounce the blessing on someone, that's something that they couldn't re revoke, so to speak. Um, today, like I said, we have that last will and testament. Ebru Esau's name meant Harry. He was the firstborn of the twins, born to Rebecca, and he was named because he was Harry, of course. They struggled in the womb, as we had read. Esau was a hunter. <laughs> And when he came home from hunting, um, you know, his brother made him some soup and sold the birthright. And I'm repeating myself, so I don't want to do that. Jacob, who was a bondsman, he was the second born of Rebecca to come into this world holding his foot. Rebecca talked about favoring him. I ain't going to ask you to raise your hands, but I think that's kind of ugly, too. A mama, a mama favoring one of her children over the other? I mean, they, one might do something that you like a little bit more, but I don't know. I just didn't like that. I guess that's why I kind of named my, my sermon after this. Um, years later, Jacob has a wife, and the word when he was feared, Esau, he saw... Later when they grew up, Jacob got married. Esau is off doing his thing. Um, he sees Esau coming and he's scared. He's afraid revenge is coming. So he sends him some gifts. And he says, I don't want your wealth. I don't want your wealth. I don't want your gifts. He says, I want to forgive you. This is where the turn comes. This is what I want to talk about, forgiveness. Colossians 3.13. Bear ye one another burden and fulfill the law of Christ. Forgive anyone if they have grievance against you. Matthew 6.14. But if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive... You can't be forgiven. 
Let's look at Luke 23, please. This is kind of long. It's the story of Jesus. I'm going to fast forward because I'm not going to read this whole thing. Go to uh, Luke 23 and I'll tell you where to start. Anyway, they were looking at Jesus and they were, they were trying to find something in him. They wanted to hang him and the people were like, once, I think it was once a year they could release one of the prisoners and the people would do with them what they wanted. Well, Herod, they, Herod and Pilate wanted to release Jesus. They didn't want to be part. They knew there was something special about him. But the people said, no, we want Barnabas. Give us Barnabas. We want you to crucify him. But they couldn't find anything wrong with them. Let's go to verse 20. Are you there? Yeah. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed so that Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, that's Barnabas, the one that they had asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. And as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simeon and Cyrene, who were on their way from the country, and put the cross on him that made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if you people do these things, when the tree is green, that will happen when it's dry. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out to him to be executed. When they came to the place called Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals. He hung with criminals. He was put in a place with criminals. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. One on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They divided up his clothes and they cast lots. Mark eleven twenty six says, If you don't forgive, neither will men forgive you, which is in heaven, your trespasses. My husband told me at a time that he was, I think, I asked him his age. He said he was about 16. He, um, he come from a poor family. There was 13 of them. 13. He was the oldest. He was the firstborn. And he had a grandmother. And she had a car. All he knew was if he read a book, he could work on it. I am a blessed woman for that reason alone. He can fix anything. So he picked up some manuals and he started reading them about cars because he knew that if he couldn't fix the cars, he was going to have to walk. And who enjoys walking when you can ride? So he found out his, he wanted to go to the roller rink. He was an avid skater. I, on the other hand, am totally not. He would push me around the roller rink only to, you know, at 15 years old, hear me squeal and fight to stay up on my skates. I stunk. But he would skate backwards and do all that fancy dancing. Well, every Friday, Saturday, and I'm probably during the week, I'm probably not quoting it correctly, but I know Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, he was there. And he found ways to make means at 16 to go. Because, see, when he was young, he had to, I think, what were you, 16 when your dad died? He was younger than that. He had to quit school. And he had to work on the farm. I'm telling a lot of my husband. I asked him if I could, and he said yes. Okay. <laughs> he said I could. I would never. 
And this isn't anything to make him look bad by any means, because he's a great man. Um, anyway, he um, had to quit school. He had to, because they worked on a farm. His father worked on a farm. So he had to work on the farm to keep the rent for the family and milk the cows. And that paid for the rent. And I think he told me they got a gallon of milk a day. And I think he told me they got a little bit of money, which he gave to his mother, so she could buy food. In fact, he said one time um, that if they didn't have a cow, they would have went hungry. I didn't know that kind of life. We are two totally different worlds that came together. But um, he had a grandmother. I just threw that in there. Had a grandmother who um, had a car who, that was broke down. He didn't want to walk to the roller rink. It was probably cold, but they, they lived many miles away. And she said, you come and you fix my transmission in my car. I'll let you take my car to the roller rink tonight. And he said, okay. So he packed up his toolbox and hitchhiked to her house and went and fixed the car and went home and took a shower, hitchhiked back home. He couldn't take the car, went back home, took a shower and hitchhiked back over to get the car. When he got back there, she said, you can't take it. And he said, but you promised me. And he said, she said, you can't take it. If you take it, I'm going to call the police on you. <laughs> you can't take the car. Well, see, he was, think about this, he was 17. He's a motorhead. When I met him, he had, this was after this, fast forwarding, he had about 20 cars ranging from valiants to judges to you name it. He had every classic car and every one of them ran. Um, but back then, he didn't have those cars. He was only 16. So anyway, there came a time in our life where, you know, how you sit and you tell stories about your childhood to one another, and she's not here no more to say, I'm sorry. So there were times that I looked at him, and I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened to you. And then there were times in my life then I told him things that happened to me, and the people aren't here anymore to tell me that they were sorry, that he would look at me and say, I'm sorry that happened to you. If I would have been there, I would have protected you. And I'm so sorry. So for those out here within my voice, if things have happened to you and you don't have any contact with people, um, or they have gone on to be with the Lord or other place, um, I want to say I'm sorry for them. It's time to release those things and let them go. Um, I, when I was at the Copeland Conference, I went in and Ken Copeland said something he says something that I always put in my pocket. I knew something was wrong for about a week with me. Things just weren't set right. I was just, I wasn't myself. I was praying. I was doing my, what I knew to do, but things, something was wrong. And I was like, God, what's wrong? So you know what I do when something's wrong? I retreat. I retreat. I pull back because I don't want anybody to see this person because it's not pretty. And if I open my mouth, I say the wrong thing, and I've been known to do that many times over, um, but I really retreat. My kids were saying, what's wrong, Mom? I said, I don't know, I don't know. Fear came in. I remember one time saying to my daughter, I said, I, said, I don't know, there's fear, there's some fear going on. And I was like, Lord, what in the world is this? So I get to the conference, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, if I don't get out of this funk, how am I ever going to receive from the Lord? And Ken Copeland, the first time we were there, said, he stood like this, and he put his arms out, and he said, judge me, Lord. And for two days, we go up there, we leave.
here on Thursday morning. We get there Thursday afternoon, we do a little couple things, and then Thursday night the conference started. So for two full days I cried. I just stood there and I wept in the presence of the Lord. There's a cleansing sometimes that happens with that. Sometimes it's very private. Sometimes for me, my mother used to say, you can turn the waterworks on and you can turn them off. But for me, it was a cleansing. I had watched so much of the news because my husband always yells at me because I don't watch the news. I'll ask him about the news. These are gates. These are gates. And I'm watching this news and I'm seeing what's going on in the political realm. And I'm, I'm praying and I know we all did. I know we all voted. Let me put a hold right there. Has anybody ever heard of the Johnson Amendment? Johnson Amendment? Anybody know what the Johnson Amendment is? That amendment was put into place, I think it was by Linda B. Johnson, to where they could not talk about the political realm from the pulpit. Did you know that our president signed an executive order to abolish that? Wow. Did you know that? Yeah. I found that out this weekend. Wow. So I'm watching the news, and I'm watching all this negative stuff, and some things are personally going on with me, and, and that's all these gates are seeing and hearing. And all I'm thinking about is my children. I don't know how many more times around the sun I have here. I don't know. I believe the Lord's going to fulfill my days, but I'm thinking about them. The choices that we make now affect them and our grandchildren and little Natalie, my great grandbaby. So I'm watching these, this news and my, my husband even woke me up the day after election. Hallelujah, it's over. He said, do you believe it? She won. And I just, I laid there in the bed. It even interrupted my sleep for a week. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I just retreated. Anyway, to go on, we ain't gonna talk about that. Um, when we got to the conference, and we started hearing Ken Copeland about the things that our president's doing, the executive orders that he's signing, I didn't know anything about. That released hope to me. And then the first lady just had a breakfast, help me with this, and all the evangelical preachers and teachers were in this breakfast. Um, and it's, it's one of the breakfasts that they haven't had in a long time, but they just introduced it again. It's now gonna be an every year event, and it was something, it was, it was but it was called the evangelical um, day and it was because of all these Christians that are surrounding our president and praying for him and interceding for him we don't know anything about we don't know anything about whether you believe in this man or not he's a Christian he is a Christian he might be a young Christian but he's a, a Christian Paula White anybody know Paula White She's his CEO. And this is the grabber for me. Somebody said um, they believed, I think it was somebody in here said that they believed, maybe it was Susie, and that's who it was. She said she believes that maybe one of the Trump boys might come up after him. And they had a meeting, if I can say this one without crying, they had a meeting and they said if we lose every Penny we have, we're going to make America great again. As a family, they said this. Wow. So I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all this. And remember, I'm going to back up. I had said to the Lord, judge me. And I didn't, I said it with tears rolling down my face because judgment it's hard. is a hard thing. And I said, I don't know what I'm asking for. But I don't want to stay in this place. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I've done. I didn't blatantly do anything wrong. I thought I had forgiven everybody, and I had, but I was letting things in that shouldn't come in. And they were affecting my sleep, 
They were affecting my Christian walk. They were even affecting my personality. And I said to the Lord, help me. And then, you know, when you're in that place of judgment, he's so good. He judges us with mercy. He doesn't judge us and tell us what we're doing wrong. He gives us correction. He said, Karen, I need you to start staying after the once a month when they have the, the functions here. You need to hang out with these people. They're your brothers and sisters. That's something that I had let slide because we get busy. I'm busy. Y'all are busy. I know. I was just looking at me. But I need what you got. I need to be around you. He said, I want you to start doing that. It's once a month, Karen, 12 times a year. He gave me correction for my life. Things that are going to help me with my walk. Um, the thing about the money, because you know they've been, and this isn't a political, um, this isn't a political speech by any means. You know, he doesn't take a salary. He doesn't take a salary from the United States of America. He does not. That's incredible. There's been one other, pre three other? Three other, I think, that have done that. Yeah? Wasn't a Hoover? I should have written it down. I had studied. I know there were a few. I'll say it that way. There were a few others. They were very wealthy. I said, I don't need your money. Listen to me, y'all. Ken Copeland spoke and said next year, the year 2020, is going to be the year of Joel 2. Mm. Anybody know Joel 2? Where your sons and your daughters will prophesy, oh, yeah. your young men are going to dream dreams, your old men are going to see visions, and on that day I will pour out of my spirit. God's going to pour out his spirit. God is. Shut your eyes a minute. I've got a word for you. This is what I hear the Lord say at this time in this place. Those things which you have seen and felt in your heart, it's the pain of rebirthing. It's something I start. When the earth has said and wished and waited for men, I sent forth my spirit in the souls of my friend. A great awakening and sudden new start for those who will stand and hold the lamp from my heart. It's a time of surrender, a time for the call, a time to come together to hear what others see on the wall. There's coming a time of encouragement that will put smiles on faces as you stand and you pray to see those come into their places. For the ones that I choose and the ones I ordain will find will be a final sweeping at the spirit, at calming of the spirit of my winds. You have seen in my word that the things start with fire first. It's only been a place to thrust ones to come up higher. Change is coming once again. A new level, some can tell. A sense in their spirits, it's felt hot as hell. As you see them cross the threshold and coming through the door, I will start with the young and fresh and new waves begin. Sing praises to the king for he will do new, new things and great things. Don't look at the differences and put me in a box. I will tweak from my spirit, cry for the lost. I hold your heart dear and count each one near and with great cost as they look and they see and they gaze and cry and carry on the dear ones. It's a time of increase of dreams and visions. Will be so as you wait for my spirit, then hear the word go. It's all for the kingdom. It's been paid for by great price. Relax in your journey, for we win in the end. It's all about great gain, that nothing be lost in hopes to draw closer and bring this time to an end. You know, there was a girl at work and I'm going to close with this. We're getting out early today. 
There was a girl at work that said, we're sitting in the stadium and we're watching a football game. We've got some people that are on the 